Statements by members. Déclaration de député. The Honorable Member for Richmond Hill. They're here. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise in this House once again and speak on the occasion of no rules. On Thursday, March 19, at 11.50 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Persians, Kurdish, Turkish, Azari, Baluch, Afghans, and Pakistanis in my community of Richmond Hill and the Greater Toronto Area will ring in the New Year with festivities, dinner, and charity drives. We face an uncertain time in Canada and in GTA as the cases of COVID-19 are on the rise. However, I want to acknowledge the ongoing hard work of all levels of government and our health care providers in helping to maintain public safety. I thank all event organizers that put the safety of our community first and postponed, rescheduled, or reformatted their celebration. To the 300 million people celebrating Nowruz in Canada and across the world, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Regina Louvain. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last weekend, a great Saskatchewan tradition continued. For 44 years, Tell Miracle has been rallying support from the great people of our province around those who need it most. Tell Miracle supports the Kinsman Foundation, who offers additional medical assistance, equipment, travel accommodations, and so much more to people with cognitive or mobility challenges. Their annual telethon is circled on every calendar in the province and boasts a loyal following of supporters and donors who tune in year after year to enjoy excellent local entertainment and support a great cause. Tell Miracle embodies the Canadian spirit of giving and their long-standing contribution to increasing the quality of life for all Saskatchewanians deserves to be celebrated. I would therefore like to offer my humble thanks on behalf of the good people of Regina Louvain to this year's Tell Miracle team who raised over $5.5 million. These funds will go to Saskatchewan individuals and families when they need it the most. And once again, Saskatchewan, thank you all for answering the call to ring those phones. Here, 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 here. Honourable Member for Surrey Newton. Mr. Speaker, on February 29th, I had the opportunity to participate in the first annual Model United Nations at Tuan West Candy School. Model UN provides youth platform that magnifies leadership and teamwork. This event allowed delegates to nurture their skills in an active, comfortable, and positive environment. Inspired by social study department head, Ms. Lindsay Hutchison, these secondary school students will be the voice to change the world, which will make Surrey Newton and all of Canada a better place. I urge all members to join me in thanking the Tuanwest School students, led delegates, sponsors, and staff for all their hard work in organizing a successful model United Nations. The Honourable Member for Laurentide La Belle. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to tell you about a volunteer in my riding who's always been devoted for her entire life and who has always worked in the shadows and with dignity. I'm talking about Ms. Léon Forget, who participated in ensuring service continuity to the most disadvantaged people in the city of Saint-Sauveur. She also put the first shovel in the ground for the Saint-Sauveur Community Garden, which helps to feed people in need. This raised the profile of the Garde Manger des Pays d'en-Haut, or Upper Country's Cupboard, but also raised her own profile. A volunteer for 17 years for La Guignolée, she's also taking care of the most vulnerable on Saint-Denis Street, as well as having brought valuable help to Soup et Compagnie, or Soup and Company. Currently, she's fighting for her life. Ms. Forgette, on behalf of all citizens, for Laurentide de la Belle, whom I represent, we say thank you, and we wish you great courage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Mississauga Center. Mr. Speaker, March is National Engineering Month, and as a fellow engineer, I want to recognize the valuable work engineers do. Engineers solve problems, identify opportunities, and create jobs. They're successfully involved in all aspects of our society. 
Engineers are building the infrastructure of our country. They're enhancing cybersecurity. They're finding new methods to reduce pollution. They're inventing clean and advanced technology, and they're designing new modes of transportation. As we transition into the new economy, engineers have a unique perspective that policymakers can benefit from. On the occasion of International Women's Day, it's important also to note that Engineers Canada and engineering schools are working on recruiting more women, more Indigenous, and more LGBTQ engineers. To all those considering joining the profession, I say, there's a place for you in engineering. On behalf of our government, I want to thank engineers for their valuable contribution to our society. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon West. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Global Institute for Water Security at the University of Saskatchewan brought together 24 water scientists from 13 institutions across Canada to meet with parliamentarians to talk about water science. They were here to share information with decision makers about scientific contributions to water security, new technology to monitor water and climate, solutions to water contamination, and equitable access to water. As a member of the Standing Committee on the Environment, as well as the Member of Parliament for Saskatoon West, I was able to pass a motion to have the Institute appear before our committee. As members, we learned of the Institute's mandate in researching ways to protect the freshwater resources for sustainable food production, to mitigate the risk of water-related disasters such as floods, droughts and fires, to predict and forecast extreme global change, and to bring solutions to Indigenous communities that face water insecurity. I want to thank Dr. Jay Familietti and his team for doing such a great job. The Honourable Member for Sherbrooke. For the International Day of Women, yes, I mean women, plural, I wish to highlight what a few women in Sherbrooke have done since the 1970s to give other women tools to try and change the framework of patriarchal society. Laurette de Montigny, who set up the first shelter for women victims of violence in 1975. Madeleine Lacombe, who set up the first sexual assault crisis center in 1978. Marie Graton, who defended women's rights in the church. Suzanne Blache, who set up the first Women's Job Bank in 1982, Lise Rouet-Paquette, who set up Women in Eastern Townships Municipal Politics in 1990, and Nicole Dorin, who contributed to the Pépine Foundation in 1993. Thank you to all of these women to, who are working to ensure that women can take their rightful place. For Brampton South. Mr. Speaker, last weekend, honoring International Women's Day, I attended many events and met up so many community leaders like Marjorie Taylor, Ruby Tillon, Parveen Rashid, Myna Adams, Angela Johnson, Mary and Christina Romano, Irene Chu, and all the young girls like Abneet, Jaspreet, in my riding, and, and many amazing Bamtonians also. I also would uh, like to recognize the organizations such as Cancer Warrior, Brampton Professional Women, Pink Attitude, Soge, and so many others who empower women. Because of you, our community is stronger. International Women's Day is an opportunity for all of us to celebrate the progress we have made and to renew our collective effort to knock down barriers facing women's advancement. I want to recognize my wonderful female colleagues in Brampton Caucus, in Cabinet, and across the aisle. These women, regardless of their political stripes, make a difference in our communities across Canada and around the world. Thank you to my family, my twin daughters, Arshi and Amrit, and of course, my mother, because of you, I'm here. Thank you, Mr. Great job. The Honorable Member for Paul Neufchat Cartier. March 20th, the Francophonie will be celebrating its 50th anniversary. People who know me know that I'm a fervent advocate of French language, culture, and history. Proud Canadian, Francophone, Quebecer, and Conservative. I rise in the House today to highlight this most important event. The previous incarnation of the International Organization for the Francophonie was launched on March 20, 1970, and it was called the Technical and Cultural Cooperation Agency. Canada is one of its 21 founding members. Based on sharing a common language, the organization promotes Francophone cultures. I'll remind you that it's the Conservative Party of Canada that committed to ensuring that federal funds granted to provinces for Francophone communities are to be spent for those purposes. Another reason to be a proud representative of the Conservative Party of Canada.
Let's continue to protect, develop, and promote our French language. Francophones and Francophile friends, I invite you to proudly celebrate the institution that is the International Organization of the Francophonie. Happy 50th anniversary. For Windsor to come soon. I rise today in the House with a heavy heart to pay tribute to the life and public service of a great Windsorite, Mr. Tom Wilson, who passed away this week. Tom was a retired teacher who taught history and geography before entering municipal politics in 1985. He faithfully served the residents of Windsor for 21 years as the city councillor for Ward 5. For many of us in the East End, he was known simply as the mayor of Forest Glade, where he supported youth athletics and organizations. He helped establish Forest Glade Optimus Park, and he also chaired the Conservation Authority and was an early champion of environmental sustainability. Tom and I ran against each other in a municipal election. He quickly became a mentor, supporter, and friend, and many times he would pick up the phone to provide insight and encouragement. More than anything, he wanted to see young people succeed. All of us in Windsor are better for knowing Tom Wilson. Rest well, Tom. Rest well, Mayor of Forest Glade. The Honourable Member for Charles Wood St. James of Sinaboya Hillingley. Mr. Speaker, for the last four years, this government has blown through their promise of a balanced budget. They told Canadians the budget would balance itself, while well, they threw a huge party using billions of dollars of their money. Mr. Speaker, the party is over. The money is drying up. This government's high taxes, wasteful spending, and massive deficits have put Canada in an incredibly weak position. But now we are up against a global pandemic, markets tanking, Canadian energy unable to get to market, thousands of jobs disappearing, economic growth screeching to a halt, millions of Canadians being less than $200 away from insolvency at the end of the month. The possibility of a made-in-Canada recession is becoming more and more real. The Prime Minister is missing in action. There is no captain at the helm of the ship. This Prime Minister has left Canada weak and vulnerable, while also leaving Canadians behind when they need strong leadership the most. The member for Red Deer at home. Speaker, I rise today to pay tribute and express our sincerest condolences on the passing of Pete Snelson, a champion for freedom and liberty, as well as a regional director for the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. I had the honour of getting to know Pete through the CSSA, where I learned Pete was a veteran. He suffered with PTSD for over 30 years, yet he tirelessly fought for better treatment for our veterans, many of whom suffer from the mental anguish that all too often accompanies military service. In his honour, the CSSA has created two scholarships that will be handed out to winners of the Peter Snelson Memorial Essay Contest. This is a fitting tribute to a man who dedicated his intelligence, creativity and energy to advancing causes of liberty and freedom. I want to extend our sincerest condolences to his mother, Mariette, his sister, Catherine, and to members of the CSSA and all of his friends and family. Pete, you will be dearly missed. Rest in peace. Here, here. The Honourable Member for London, Fanshawe. Today, the World Health Organization declared the COVID-19 outbreak a pandemic. Mr. Speaker, this pandemic does not affect everyone equally. The most vulnerable people will be ultimately hit the hardest. People without sick leave can't afford to stay home from work. They lose their pay and maybe their jobs. A disproportionately high number of these people are women and come from marginalized groups. And many of them work in the service industry, in food service, they are caregivers and frontline workers. It's in everyone's best interest that they stay home if they are sick, but they are also among the half of all Canadians who are $200 away from insolvency. A day's less pay could mean missing that month's rent or the ability to put food on the table. Other countries are finding ways to help and take care of their people, but 45 days into this outbreak, the Liberals are still, quote, exploring additional measures. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals need to spend less time talking about helping people and actually start helping people. The Honourable Member for Shefford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to pay tribute to a citizen of my riding, Simon Thibault, who is living with epilepsy. Thirty years ago, Simon Thibault experienced his first seizure. At 43 years old, he wasn't going to let epilepsy stop him at all. In partnership with Epilepsy Montérégie, he launched and will participate in Défi Simon, or Simon's Challenge, a ride for epilepsy. He will ride 
1,200 kilometers on his bicycle from July 4th to 10th in order to raise awareness and to teach the public about epilepsy with his two sons, William and Raphael, who will ride with him. And supported by his wife, Valérie, and his daughter, Liliane, he will visit associations that offer services to people with epilepsy in Quebec, Chicoutimi, Pespiac, and, of course, Granby. This is an admirable way of sending a message of hope to all those who are living with epilepsy. And on top of all that, Simon wants to show those who are living with epilepsy that this illness must never prevent them from breaking down barriers and prejudices. Good luck, Simon. The member for Calgary, Shepherd. On February 29th, the rarest day of all. This year's theme, rare is many worldwide, rare is strong every day, rare is proud everywhere. Millions of Canadians, two-thirds of them children, are affected by one of over 7,000 rare diseases. Only one in three of these Canadians can access needed treatments. The hardest experience as a father is to care for a loved one with an incurable condition. My three oldest kids suffer from the rare kidney disorder called Alport syndrome, which is incurable, genetic, and degenerative. My youngest da daughter passed away two years ago now from Patau syndrome, and no day goes by without me thinking of her. I joined patients across the country to call on the federal government to abandon the changes to the PNPRB, go back to patient stakeholders and work out a solution that makes access to treat treatments the first and most important value, instead of price controls that block access to medication. Mr. Speaker, I invite all members to join me to celebrate Rare Disease Day. The Honourable Member for Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam. Mr. Speaker, the Bank of Canada is looking for Canadians to put on a new $5 bill. There is no shortage of great Canadians to be recognized in this way, but in this bright firmament, no light shines brighter than Terry Fox. Oh, yeah. Terry Fox is a Port Coquitlam hometown hero and a national symbol of resilience. He was a great national hero. Into the Atlantic, in St. John's, and began his marathon of hope. He continues to inspire Canadians. Through his own battle and the, and the fight that carries on in his name, countless lives have been saved. Many cancers, including the one that took Terry's own life, are now treatable thanks to his legacy thanks to the way he chose to face, face this vicious illness. But the work is not done. Canada still needs Terry Fox. Nous avons encore besoin de Terry Fox. We still need Terry Fox. Five. Up here. Up here. <laughs> Oral questions, question oral, the Honourable Leader. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister likes to blame everyone else for his failures. And I have no doubt that in the days ahead he's going to blame things like the coronavirus and the stock market crash for Canada's weak economic performance. But the reality is, long before those things happened, Canada's economy was already headed for trouble. Last quarter's results were a feeble 0.3%. Now most economists are slashing their projections for future growth. The Prime Minister's strategy of choking our economy with red tape, raising taxes on small businesses, and wasting billions on things like fridges for Loblaws clearly isn't working. Will he change course? Eric Harvey, right honourable Prime Minister. As Canadians know, we have a very different approach on the economy from the Conservatives. We believe in investing in Canadians, investing in the middle class, investing in infrastructure, and that's exactly what we've done over these past five years. And what that actually has led to is not only have we seen Canadians create over a million jobs while having uh, among the healthiest balance sheets in the G7, uh, but we've also lifted over a million Canadians out of poverty. Mr. Speaker, our approach of investing in Canadians and in their communities is working and we're going to continue. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The problem is, Mr. Speaker, is that they're not investing in Canadians, they're investing in law laws. They're investing in MasterCard. They're giving out billion dollar bonuses to Bombardier that can get passed on to executive bonuses. And they are right. They do make different choices and the results speak for themselves. From 2010 to 2015, 
Canada's economy consistently outperformed the U.S. under the previous Conservative government. Now, under this Liberal government, Canadian growth is almost a full percentage point behind the U.S. So will the Prime oh. Minister admit that his spending is getting Canada nowhere? Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, the very first thing we did when we took office was cut class, cut taxes for the middle class and raise them on the wealthiest 1 per cent. The Conservatives voted against that. Then we brought in a Canada Child Benefit that stopped sending child benefit checks to millionaires that the Conservatives supported, and instead we gave more money every month to 9 out of 10 Canadian families tax-free. That measure has lifted hundreds of thousands of kids out of poverty, over a million Canadians out of poverty poverty because we've kept investing in Canadians, in their communities, in the future we are building together, and on fighting climate change. That is the future Canadians expect. Yeah. <laughs> Under the previous Conservative government, when times were good, we paid down the debt to give Canada the flexibility that it needed to respond to the global economic recession. As a result, under the Conservative government, Canada was last into the recession and the first one out. The Prime Minister's taken a completely different approach. While times were good, he wasted money by throwing it around to his corporate friends. As a result, investment in Canada is down. Investors are fleeing Canada for other countries. Instead of choking our economy with red tape and new taxes, will the Prime Minister unleash the free market by lowering taxes on job creators and eliminating wasteful red tape? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, Conservative governments under Stephen Harper added $150 billion to Canada's national debt. We focused instead on investing in Canadians, and they may feel that investing in the Canada Child Benefit is wasting money. They may feel like lifting a million people out of poverty doesn't count for much, but we know it makes a real difference in the lives of Canadians, and that's why we're going to keep putting Canadians first, not the kind of petty politics that Conservatives do every single day. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Providing support directly to parents is a Conservative principle that this party fought against for years, Mr. Speaker. The results speak for themselves. While the Conservatives were in power, investors were fighting to get their money into Canada. Now we see major investors like Warren Buffett fleeing Canada because of the political instability that he has caused. Under his watch, business investment in equipment has dropped by 20% and more than $150 billion has left our country's energy sector. Will the Prime Minister admit that giving handouts to Loblaws and MasterCard is not investing in Canadians? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, foreign direct investment has actually increased 19 per cent last year because of the initiatives we put forward. And the member opposite wants to talk about Berkshire Hathaway. He should probably look at the fact that Berkshire Hathaway just announced an investment of $200 million in a wind farm in Alberta. That is a good thing, Mr. Speaker. And we know that continuing to draw in global investment as we move our economy forward is absolutely important. Only a Liberal would think that losing $4 billion on one hand is somehow leaving us better off, Mr. Speaker. Monsieur le Président, nous savons... Mr. Speaker, we know that the Prime Minister is doing everything in his power to cover up his interference in the legal system. He even dismissed his former Attorney General to keep her quiet. But there was a time when the bloc was against the Liberals, when Gilles Duchesne Duceppe was the lever, the leader. The bloc helped to expose liberal corruption. What quid pro quo did the PM offer the bloc to cover up its corruption? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Canadians expect their prime minister to be there to defend jobs, and that's exactly what I've done, and that's what I'm going to continue to do. I respect our legal system, and I'm protecting jobs and workers across the country. I, bef before continuing, I just want to remind the honourable members, I have my bifocals on, so not only can I hear you, I can see at distance as well. So I can see you shouting. The honourable member for Berlay chambly Mr. Speaker, I'd like to say that the bloc did not want to give the Conservatives the chance to start screaming that all Quebecers 
are accomplices. The Prime Minister had uh, uh, finally adopted a plan to reflect what the World Health Eco Association has recognized now, but the government has ignored the most pressing concerns. They're not equipped to face uh, possible coronavirus cases. Can the Prime Minister announce a plan to manage the borders? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Since the beginning of this crisis with coronavirus, we informed and invested in our borders and in our officers to ensure that Canadians and tri travellers that are arrive to Canada have measures that keep them safe. And we're going to always base our s decisions on science and on the recommendations of experts. And that's what we've always done. The Honourable Member for Belay Chambly. Mr. Speaker, it would have been nice if the government had acted upstream and had not have to catch up, play catch up to face this serious and worrisome c situation. Can he ensure better control of the borders and hold daily press points to increase and also increase the purchasing powers of seniors over 65 years of age, the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have and we're going to continue in to invest through our health system to ensure that we can keep Canadians safe. We recognize that this is a crisis that will have an impact on our economy, on our workers, on Canadians, on seniors, and our economy. So that's why we're going to invest to help seniors to support various sectors of the economy that are ex experiencing difficulties. And we always seek to help vulnerable Canadians in this situation and others, all others. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Burnaby Sud. The plan proposed by the Liberals today does nothing for 60 per cent of workers who don't have access to employment insurance. For these workers, it's a, an impossible decision they have to make between staying home or going to work. Is the PM ready to establish a new program to support all workers to stay at home? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. We understand full well the concerns of Canadians who are facing difficulties both in terms of health and the safety of their families or in terms of their job and our economic security. And that is why we're putting forth measures to help workers and companies to be able to continue support families and communities. And at the same time, we're always looking to do more to help those who will be experiencing difficulties. We recognize that there are seconds of the populations that won't have access to employment insurance, and that's why we're working for them as well. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. The Minister seems to not understand is the vast majority of Canadians will not have access to his plan. 60% of Canadian workers have no access to employment insurance. Imagine a service worker who is stuck with the impossible decision. Do they go to work so they can pay their bills or do they stay at home and prevent the spread of a, of a disease but risk not being able to pay the rent? Will the Prime Minister commit today to ensuring that all workers have paid sick leave? Here, here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, that's what I talked about this morning, the fact that our government will be there for all Canadians who are facing important decisions uh, in keeping Canada safe, in keeping their fellow citizens safe, in keeping their families safe. We know that the decisions that Canadians can take and will take in the coming days and weeks will have an impact on delaying the spread of coronavirus in Canada and keeping uh, Canadians uh, safer. That's why we're going to make sure we're working hard to support Canadians right across the economy through EI, but also through other systems. The Honourable Member for Richemont, Arthabasca. Yesterday, the Prime Minister scoffed when I asked a simple question. What did the PM offer the leader of the bloc to buy his vote to ensure that the Ethics Commissioner does not testify on the Trudeau II report on the Prime Minister's interference in our legal system and to respect our institutions and the people who work there. And that's what Canadians expect from us. But Conservatives are constantly playing petty politics. The Honourable Member for Richemont, Arthur Basque. 
the only job that the Bloc and the PM are trying to save is the Prime Minister's job. There is a report from the uh, Ethics Commissioner wanted to testify on this report, but all we know is that there was an agreement and the that this report shows that the PM interfered in our legal system. And what did he do to buy the bloc's vote to avoid the commissioner from testifying at the committee? The right honourable prime minister, Mr. Speaker, Canadians are concerned by the coronavirus, and they're concerned by economic opportunities and the economy of the future. Canadians are concerned by what's going to happen in the next few weeks. But the Conservatives are only concerned by petty politics that they're trying to play. They want to open up old files. And we're focusing on the well-being of workers and of Canadians. And that is what Canadians expect from us. And that's what we're going to do always, Mr. Speaker. Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, Rideau Lakes. Mr. Speaker, the quid pro quo between the Liberal Bloc coalition is disgusting. And when Conservatives tried to invite the Ethics Commissioner to testify on the Trudeau 2 report into the Prime Minister's corruption, a PMO enforcer spoke directly to the Bloc MP and bought her vote. Canadians deserve to know the full truth about the Prime Minister's interference in our judicial system. What did the Prime Minister give to the Bloc to help him muzzle the Ethics Commissioner? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> the Honourable Member. is hoping this goes away, but we know an RCMP investigation is ongoing, as we heard from the lobbying commissioner. The full breadth of the interference in our judicial system must come to light. And the Bloc helping the Prime Minister cover up his corruption makes them complicit in his crime. We know the leader of the Bloc met with the Prime Minister last week. Can the Prime Minister confirm that this is when he cut a deal to cover up his corruption? I just want to remind the honourable members that accusing someone of a crime is rather extreme, and I want to warn them. Being in contempt of the speaker is not a good thing, so I wouldn't shout while I'm speaking. That's not a good thing. What I'm asking you is to be a little more judicious when you're asking your questions or giving your answers. So please be careful. We want to make sure that this place is as respectful as possible. The responsibility of the Prime Minister is to stand up for Canadians while upholding the law, and that is exactly what we've done. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has the cheek to talk about petty politics, but the Commissioner's report is entitled Trudeau II. The Ethics Commissioner's report underscores the PM's behaviour in this scandal. He used his position of authority over the Minister of Justice in an attempt to influence her decision. We wanted the Commissioner to testify at the committee, but the Bloc was in cahoots with the Liberals to muzzle the Commissioner. What did the PM concede to the Separatists for this cover-up? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Nothing. <laughs> the Honourable Min Minister, uh, PM for uh, Louis Saint Laurent. This is the Prime Minister's bold behaviour and that of the bloc that prevented the Ethics Commissioner from testifying before Canadians with respect to the Trudeau II report. The bloc was complicit with the PM's immoral behaviour, and we weren't able to hear from the Ethics Commissioner. The bloc and the Liberal Liberals prevented him from testifying. So what is the PM going to do in this situation? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. It is the responsibility of the Prime Minister to defend jobs across the country while def 
upholding the law, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Honorable. The Honourable Member for belle Chambly. Mr. Speaker, if the Conservatives don't, the Bloc is ready. If they don't want to be the official opposition. We're ready to make gains for Quebec, and the Conservatives are making gains for Conservatives. And the Bloc Québécois has someone to negotiate, but they want to know if the Prime Minister is going to protect access to border and if seniors will have strengthened purchasing power. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, we're going to continue to follow expert advice and listen to health authorities to ensure that everyone who comes to Canada is informed about how they can protect themselves and is properly followed up. And we're going to continue to invest in our seniors like we did when, when we took power in 2015 by increasing the GIS for the most vulnerable seniors. And we're always going to help our seniors. That's part of our approach to help all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Montcalm. The government's underfunding of health is not the only issue in this fight against the coronavirus. It's an ongoing issue that affects the quality of care. It's a permanent issue that hampers the work of our doctors and nurses. Our hospitals are already overflowing, and when the coronavirus crisis will be solved, they'll still be overcrowded. Can the government kill two birds with one stone and resolve this ongoing issue by increasing the transfers to 5.2 percent, like Quebec and other provinces are demanding? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, in terms of the coronavirus, we recognize how important it is for the provincial authorities have the necessary resources to keep Canadians healthy and safe. And that is why we made an announcement today to transfer a half a million dollars to the provinces to help them tackle the virus. At the same time, we're always going to be ready to work with the provinces to improve the health system for Canadians, while, of course, respecting provincial jurisdiction. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent, Mr. Speaker, this has been an interesting question period. He said there were negotiations with the, the PM, and what did these lead to? They led to the fact that the Ethics Commissioner wasn't able to testify before Canadians. The Bloc was an accomplice in muzzling the Commissioner. There was an RCMP investigation inve investigation that's ongoing on these criminal actions. What did he give the Bloc to muzzle the Ethics Commissioner, the Right Honourable Prime Minister? Mr. Speaker, nothing. Edmonton Riverbend. China, Iran, Italy and South Korea have all been designated high-risk areas and the WHO is now declaring COVID-19 a pandemic. While screening measures when entering Canada or travelling within Canada still have not been updated, the WHO is asking countries to take urgent and aggressive measures. The government has the ability under the Quarantine Act to require all individuals who have visited high-risk areas to be placed in quarantine. When will they use it? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, every step of the way, we have followed the advice of experts and public health officials on how to best protect Canadians. On this side of the aisle, Mr. Speaker, we believe in science. We unmuzzled scientists. We listened to experts in how to make uh, our decisions to keep Canadians safe. And so far, Mr. Speaker, that has borne out. We are continuing to monitor very closely how the coronavirus evolves in Canada, encouraging Canadians to take steps to keep themselves safe. And we will continue to inform Canadians at all border areas of how to keep themselves safe and how to keep all Canadians safe. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg. It's been reported that travellers who arrive to our airports are asked additional questions to determine their point of origin and to better detect people who may be carrying the coronavirus. We've been informed that these questions haven't been updated for quite some time. The virus is spreading 
across different countries, Italy, Iran, and even the state of New York. Can the prime minister confirm that uh, our automatic systems have been updated to, to include these countries? As always, the health and safety of Canadians is a priority for us. We are following all the public health recommendations based on science and knowledge. We've increased inspection and we've added processes for detecting the virus at all our airports and points of entry. We're going to continue to watch the situation very carefully and make the necessary changes as needed. The member for Charbourg. Inaudible for the interpreter. When a plane lands in Canada, we know where travelers are coming from when they cross the borders legally as well. But we know that people who cross the border illegally, such as at Roxham Road, as they do every day, we don't know where they come from or where they're going. And that's the rea with the reality of the coronavirus. Can the Prime Minister at least tell us if the necessary precautions are being taken? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, for quite some time now, we've been telling the opposition members that, yes, the security of Canadians has never been compromised at the border or even between these border crossings. We ensure the identity and safety of all travellers who come to Canada, whether they're irregular or regular travelers. Mr. Speaker, yesterday I asked the Minister of Indigenous Services when his government would stop breaking the law and honour the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal ruling to immediately stop discriminating against First Nations children. This was followed by 10 seconds of silence and then story time. The same silence was heard about a plan for COVID-19 on reserve. Mr. Speaker, when will the minister follow the rule of law, honour the tribunal ruling and stop discriminating against First Nations children? Here, here. Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, we strongly agree we must compensate Indigenous children harmed by past government policies. It must be done in a way that is both fair and timely to further healing. We've worked closely with the parties and found consensus on a number of key areas. We've demonstrated our commitment to addressing long-standing child and family service needs of First Nations, Inuit and Métis children. We will continue working with our partners to ensure Indigenous children are supported and cared for in the right way with connection to community and culture. The Honourable me me the Member for Timmins, James Bay. Really? You know, this past week, a little child from Attawapiskat had to be flown to Kingston because of the damage that tap water is doing to her body. And a little boy in Keshechuan suffered horrific burns. And the only thing the medical clinic could do was to send him home, because that's the face of third world health in the north. So when the prime minister doesn't even bother to give a permanent seat to his indigenous service minister at his COVID-19 table, you know what indigenous people know? They know they're going to get a third world response. Does this prime minister have any clue what COVID-19 is going to do when it hits the overcrowded reserves in northern Canada? Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker. The federal government is responsible for delivering health care uh, to Indigenous communities and uh, to the Canadian Armed Forces. I can assure you uh, that all necessary authorities are involved in all discussions about how to ensure that we're keeping Canadians safe, including Indigenous Canadians who, as the member well pointed out, are in much more vulnerable situations quite often. That is why we are focusing very much on what we can do to make sure that coronavirus and its potential impacts do not devastate Indigenous communities. Communities. The Honourable Member for Chateauguay La Colle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since 2015, our government has been making responsible investments in Canadians, including lowering taxes, supporting families, and giving everyone a fair chance to succeed. Because of these investments, Canada and Canadians are in a strong position to respond to emerging challenges. Will the Minister of Finance? Please update this House on when the government will present Budget 2020. Well, Minister of Finance. Mr. President. Mr. Speaker, we have made significant investments over the past four years to improve the lives of all Canadians. It's very important for our economy. At the same time, we have improved our fiscal situation. Position is so important for our ability to deal with challenges, real challenges that Canadians recognizing 
that we're facing in the economy today. And that's why I'm so pleased to address those challenges to bring forward Budget 2020. I'm pleased to announce that on March 30th at 4 p.m., we will be presenting Budget 2020. And Mr. Speaker, I ask that an order of the day be designated for that purpose. Bravo. Bravo. Mr. Speaker, this past week in my riding, I got to meet little Owen. Owen is four months old, and his mom and dad brought him to an event that I hosted. While I was holding this beautiful baby boy and noticing how strong and alert he was, his mom and dad told me that Owen has cystic fibrosis, and they wanted help from me to get the medication that he needs to live the life that he deserves. Can the Prime Minister tell families like Owen's family and others when they can expect to have access to the life-saving drug Trikafta? Thank you. The Prime Minister. We recognize the impossible situations that far too many families are in with, with children who suffer either from rare diseases or diseases that require extremely expensive medication. That is one of the reasons why we put forward uh, a rare diseases, a high cost drug strategy to help provinces across the country deliver the drug care that is actually needed. Uh, we've also moving forward on creating better access to more affordable drugs uh, for families that need them right across the country. It's part of our commitment to make sure that nobody ever has to pick between paying for rent or paying for the medication that they need. The Honourable Member for Provence. Mr. Speaker, we'll try this again. Ethan, Janelle and Tyler are just a few of my constituents who suffer from cystic fibrosis. Ethan isn't even two, and Janelle and Tyler are both young entrepreneurs. They need a new medication to help them reach their full potential. That medication is Trikafta, and it's not available here in Canada because of the regulations that are deterring the drug maker from making them available here. What will the Prime Minister commit to today to make sure that Ethan, Tyler, and Janelle have access to this life-saving medication here in Canada? The right Honourable Prime Minister. First of all, our heart goes out to families who are uh, struggling, with family members who are, uh, who are uh, faced with illness. It is truly heartbreaking. We know the importance of patient access to new therapies for serious or life-threatening conditions. To date, the manufacturer of Trifacta has not submitted an application to market this product in Canada. It is the manufacturer's decision to apply to market their product in Canada. For serious or life-threatening conditions such as cystic fibrosis, physicians may request access to the drug through the Special Access Program. To help Canadians get better access to effective treatments, we're working with provinces, territories and other partners to develop a national strategy for high-cost drugs for rare diseases. Member for Alderman Norfolk. Well, Mr. Speaker, earlier today, my colleagues and I sent a letter urging the Prime Minister to work with us to address flooding along the Great Lakes. Many people in Alderman Norfolk have businesses and their homes right along the shoreline. And that shoreline has already seen record high water levels. Mr. Speaker, these people aren't just worried about potential damages, but also for their safety. Will the Prime Minister set partisan politics aside and work with us to address this very serious issue? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, the safety and security of Canadians is, of course, always a primary concern for this government. We will work to ensure the safety of Canadians along the Great Lakes and elsewhere. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we recognize that the prevalence of extreme weather events and flooding is only going to increase with, the, with climate change. That is why making serious measures uh, to fight against climate change, like a price on pollution right across the country, are the kinds of things that Canadians expect and that, Cana that Conservatives have closed their ears and hearts to Canadians on. The Honourable Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Mr. Speaker, for a Prime Minister that wants to work across the aisle and work together, that answer is not acceptable. This is very, very simple. It seems like the Prime Minister is more interested in attacking the opposition than protecting homes, livelihoods and safety of thousands of Canadians living along the shores of the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River. Can the Prime Minister let those Canadians know what detailed action he's taking this year from a potentially devastating spring thaw? And will he commit to working with us? It's very simple on a bipartisan committee to help these people out. Yeah, yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
water levels in the Great Lakes, the International Joint Council, a joint panel between Canada and the United States, manages these levels. We are working with the U.S. and the IJC, who is actively examining measures to address these issues. The IJC will be providing a briefing to members in the coming weeks. I invite the member opposite to join. But again, Mr. Speaker, fighting climate change will be an important part of keeping these Canadians safe, and I invite the members to join with us on that as well. The Honourable Member for Avignon, La Métis, Matan Matapédia. Mr. Speaker, we were pleased to learn that the government will invest $1 billion in dealing with the coronavirus. But there is nothing in this plan that is reassuring about security. Border officers are being left to themselves with this in airports. and They have warned that Health Canada's two or three extra people are not enough. Even travellers are concerned that they've been able to come back to Canada without being asked a single question. Will the government tighten up security measures? Prevention is better, especially when there is no cure. The Right Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. This government has been making decisions to keep Canadians safe, and these decisions are based on expert recommendations. They are science-based decisions. Travellers coming back to Canada have to meet with border officers, and they have to tell them whether they are sick or whether or not they have been exposed to an illness. We will continue to inform travellers arriving in Canada about measures that must be taken to protect them, and we will take all necessary steps to keep Canadians safe. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, while corona screening measures in airports may be insufficient, they are entirely absent from land borders. No protocols for people arriving by train, bus or car. COVID-19 isn't just in three countries overseas, Mr. Speaker. It's in our neighbouring country. Just the other side of the border, in the state of New York, there are almost 200 cases. At the border, no masks, no thermometers, no information. Nothing, Mr. Speaker. Will the government implement a protocol so that border officers can protect themselves and the public? The Right Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we make decisions based on recommendations from public health experts, based on experts in epidemic preventions. We will take all necessary responsible steps to protect Canadians and travellers, as well as workers, in our uh, border crossings. We do have screening and detection measures. They have been added in all international airports at land borders and at points of entry, and we will continue to do everything in our power to protect Canadians and to delay the spread of coronavirus. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi Le Fjord. Mr. Speaker, Ener Energy Saguenay will produce LNG with 84 per cent less greenhouse gas emissions than its competitors all over the world, thanks to hydroelectricity. Investors are no longer interested in investing in Canada, which is jeopardizing billions of dollars in investment and thousands of jobs. How will the Prime Minister tell the people of Chicoutimi Le Fjord and all over Canada that they're losing big projects because of the uncertainty that he created and his lack of leadership? The Right Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, this project is in an assessment process. It's the very beginning of the process. We're working with the resources sector to create good jobs and attract, in attract investment. More than 400 big resources projects are happening in Canada, more, 400 more than last year, and that's the most in Canada. Direct foreign investment has increased by 19 per cent. Investors throughout the world are looking for sustainable projects and we are positioning Canada so that we will all benefit from this. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, we now know the date that the government will present yet another deficit budget. Yet, $100 billion in new debt has so far only bought us an economy that is grinding to a halt, down to 0.3 per cent before the corona crisis even struck. Before that crisis, half of Canadians were $200 away from insolvency and $150 billion of, co of projects had been cancelled. Given that the past $100 billion has bought so little, how much can Canadians expect to get from this next Liberal deficit budget? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
Only a conservative would think that a million people lift out of, lifted out of poverty in this country is so little. Only a conservative would think that a million new jobs created by Canadians over the past four years is so little. Our plan is to invest in Canadians, to support families, to lower taxes for the middle class and raise them on the wealthiest 1 percent has delivered for the Canadian economy, and that is why we have room to maneuver. We have firepower ready uh, to go on uh, this coronavirus challenge we're facing. We know that investing in Canadians is the right path forward. Conservatives still don't get it. We, we had started off really well and got a bumpy, and now we're starting up again. So I just want to remind the honourable members that if someone's asking a question or answering a question, please show some respect. The honourable member for Carleton. Well, for the 200,000 people who've lost their jobs in the energy sector, this government has done nothing but give the power for them to be fired, <laughs> rather than the firepower he now talks about. In fact, there's no firepower left. They've already racked up a $30 billion deficit before the corona crisis even struck. We go in to this storm with a leaky roof, a cracked foundation, and empty cupboards awaiting Canadians. So what is this government going to do to get us out of the mess in which we find ourselves in this treacherous time? Here, here. Right Honourable Prime Minister. Again, Mr. Speaker, we hear the Conservatives choosing to talk down the Canadian economy, to talk down Canadian workers. I actually suggest that the member opposite uh, listen to someone he regularly quotes, the Parliamentary Budget Officer, who laid out very clearly the fact that we have significant fiscal capacity to be able to return, respond to the challenges that we're facing because of uh, the global challenge of the coronavirus. We will continue to respond and to invest in Canadians because that is what has lifted a million people out of poverty. That's what has led Canadians to create a million new jobs. The Honourable Member for Orléans. Mr. Speaker, Canada's strength lies in its strong, diverse and inclusive communities. Since we took office in 2015, local community LGBTQ2 organizations have seen increased support on the part of this government. Canadians may be surprised to learn that so-called conversion therapy still exists in this country. Three provinces and several municipalities have already taken steps to ban this dubious and dangerous practice. Can the Prime Minister tell us what the Government of Canada is doing in this matter? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, I'd like to thank my colleague for her important question as well as for her tireless work in the riding of Orléans. Our government believes that Canadians should be able to live their lives freely. And that is why we have brought forward a substantive and progressive bill that will criminalize this harmful and destructive practice of conversion therapy. We will continue to work with provinces, territories and our allies to continue building a country where each and every Canadian can live free of discrimination and truly be themselves. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Across the GTA, there are shootings almost daily. We know from the Toronto Police Chief the weapons of choice for criminals are smuggled guns. Mr. Speaker, when caught, these dangerous criminals are getting bail. When convicted, they get a slap on the wrist. Will the Prime Minister commit today to support my bill, which will keep criminals behind bars who knowingly use smuggled guns? Speaker, we are significantly strengthening border control measures to uh, interdict the supply of uh, illegal guns from the United States, but we know that won't be enough. That is why we've made the decision to strengthen gun control by banning uh, assault-style weapons, uh, by moving forward on giving cities the opportunity uh, to restrict uh, handguns uh, within their city limits. And I encourage the member opposite, if he cares uh, about Canadians who are suffering from the impacts of gun violence, to support our decision decision to strengthen gun control rather than Conservatives' approach to weaken gun control and make Canadians less safe. The Honourable Ruth, member for Battle River Crowfoot. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Public Safety refuses to stop his plan to give needles to prison inmates. 
This is liberal hypocrisy at its finest. The government is quick to punish law-abiding gun owners, while at the same time literally give convicted felons a weapon while they are in prison. Will the Prime Minister commit today to listen to those on the front lines of Canada's correctional institutions and immediately stop the prison needle exchange program? The Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, our priority is always the safety and security of all Canadians. The prevention and treatment of infectious diseases protects everyone, including correctional service officers. Correctional services conducts thorough threat risk assessments before inmates are approved to participate in this program, and the appropriate safeguards are always in place. Since the introduction of this program, there have been no safety incidents involving staff or other inmates. This is yet another example of Conservatives' approach uh, that doesn't work to keep Canadians safe, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Charleswood St. James, Assiniboia Headingley. Mr. Speaker, this government just loves to waste Canadians' money. We've recently learned the CRA paid over $73,000 to ask a focus group if they would like to change the color of their envelopes. Oh. Envelope color, what a joke. What a joke. Does the Prime Minister really think that spending double Canadian median income on this is really an effective way to spend Canadians' wow. hard-earned tax dollars? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, when we took office, we promised to invest in Canadians, and that's exactly what we're doing. We also promised uh, to stop the using of public money for partisan purposes that the Conservatives under Stephen Harper did as a routine approach. Uh, the wastes brought forward by the Conservative government were entirely inappropriate. That was why uh, we chose to do things like restore the long-form census to make sure that the decisions that Canada, Canadian governments can take is based on needs of communities. We will continue continue to engage with Canadians. The Honourable Member for Scarborough Centre. Mr. Speaker, now more than ever, Canadians rely on cell phones for their work, school, finances and health care, making access to high quality and affordable service absolutely essential. But cell phones and wireless bills are still putting too much strain on too many Canadian households. Can the Prime Minister please update Canadians on the latest steps this Liberal government has taken to reduce cell phone prices. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for Scarborough Centre for her continued advocacy on affordability for the middle class and her incredibly hard work. Last election, we made a clear commitment to Canadians that we would lower their cell phone bills. Last week, we announced a clear plan to ensure that the three national cell phone providers make uh, offer plans 25 per cent cheaper. This is one of the many ways we are making life more affordable for the Canadians middle, Canada's middle class and those who working hard to join it. The Honourable Member for Esquimalt Saanich Souk. More than 15 months ago, I asked the Prime Minister to act on rising HIV infection rates in Canada. Yet the number of new cases here has continued to climb, while countries where HIV testing and treatment are more accessible have seen reductions by over 30 per cent. China is already putting self-test kits in vending machines on university campuses. So as we hope to see approval of Canadian self-test kits soon, can the Prime Minister tell us how his government plans to make sure that those kits will actually be accessible to young gay men, racialized and marginalized Canadians, and Indigenous communities? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to begin by thanking the Honourable Member for his tireless advocacy on behalf of all Canadians, and particularly uh, marginalized Canadians. We recognize that HIV AIDS continues to be a problem uh, in communities right across the country. That is why we're working with public health officials and experts across the country to ensure that we're giving people the tools to keep themselves and their communities safe. We will continue to work uh, with all members in this House to ensure that we're doing the right things to keep Canadians safe. This is two three. That's all questions for today. Thank you. Tabling of documents. Pursuant to subsection 79.2 of the Parliament of Canada Act, it's my duty to present to the House a report from the Parliamentary Budget Officer entitled